Um, thank you all for coming. I mean, as many of you know, I'm Steele Stillman, and I teach in this department. Um, and today we are lucky to have uh, uh, LA-based Morgan Fisher um, here to talk with us. And I'm just going to read you a real quick little intro, which probably I have things in it that Morgan would argue with. Um, but I just kind of cobbled it together from bits of things that I either knew or read. So you can both argue or wear anything else as I go. Um, Los Angeles-based artist and filmmaker Morgan Fisher was born in Washington, D.C. First achieved widespread recognition in the early 70s for a body of experimental films that deconstructed the language of cinema. Come on, you can keep kind of coming in if you want with this. It's like, the, you know, the seating on the floor, in, uh, it's tight. Yeah, there probably is room for two or three other people squeezing in here. We'll get cozy side by side. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there are any ways to squeeze those chairs further to the side. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's good. So we, got, we have a double row, double seating in the aisle. Thank you, John. Yeah, excellent, excellent. The department that sits together, what works together, everybody's, everybody's success. Okay. Beginning again, Los Angeles-based artist and filmmaker Morgan Fisher first achieved widespread recognition and recognition in the early 70s for a body of experimental films that deconstructed the language of cinema. Fisher's films collectively reveal aspects of the medium that conventional films conceal. The camera and other equipment, the presence of production assistants and director, the editing process, even the standard length and gauge of the film stock itself. From his relatively early, the director and his actor looking at footage showing preparations from unmade film two, that's the title, made in 1968, and production stills, a film made in 1970, to his later masterpieces, Standard Gauge, 1984, and a film that I guess is referred to generally as parenthesis, which has two parenthesis signs with a space in between, which was made in 2003, which some of you in my class saw last year, Fisher has helped define the history of experimental cinema. As if that were not enough, beginning in the late 1990s, Fisher turned his attention to the problems and possibilities of painting, questioning and reframing the subtle conventions of that medium with an equally rigorous self-reflexivity. His paintings and painting installations investigate systems of perspective and color relations the shape, thickness, and orientation of each painting, the position of the viewer, and especially the relationship between paintings or groups of paintings and the architectural spaces they occupy. Fisher's approach to these quite different media is remarkably consistent, and his talk here will elaborate on their continuities. He's also, was pointing out to me, as, uh, of course, has had a lot of, has paid a lot of attention to photography, and has worked some degree in photography over the years, but he'll elaborate on that later, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> Fisher graduated from Harvard with a degree in fine art before attending film schools in Los Angeles. Um, in the years, that was mostly in the 60s, in the years since, his work has been exhibited all over the world. Recent solo exhibitions include ones at the Generali Foundation in Vienna and Porticus, Frankfurt. A retrospective of his films appeared at the Whitney Museum in 2006. Interior, Color, Beauty, an exhibition of his new paintings uh, opened last week at Bartolami Gallery in Chelsea, and I really recommend everybody seeing it. Um, he has a piece in T.J. Wilcox's uh, exhibit, In the Air, which opens tomorrow, I think, at the Whitney Museum. Hmm? A film, yes. Um, and on Sunday, uh, Morgan will be delivering the keynote speech at a day-long conference on Jack, or maybe it's a half-day-long conference, technically speaking, at, uh, on Jack Goldstein at the Jewish Museum. So please welcome uh, Morgan Fisher. <laughs> We have a lot of ground to 
Carver, I'm from Stanford. Um, is there a way you can find a seat that makes me uncomfortable to see the Stanford? On the other hand, you're that much closer to the door. So, now, um, a couple of things. Um, if you just can't stand it, leave. My feelings won't be hurt, but I don't know who you are, but Steele knows who you are. So, if you leave, you enter the steel. And I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not. I'm not the one to be uh, responsible to. Um, I feel I'm very grateful to Steele for inviting me. I also, <clears throat> I also feel he's running a certain risk because um, they're all photography students, I think. Is that correct? So video. So, okay, so it's all um, either, so it's lens based. It's, it's lens based, lens based work. And um, well, that's fine. Yes. Um, photography is a part of my work, but photography constructed very broadly. And then more recently, I've wandered away from, from photography somewhat. But my first relation to photography, which involved what I would call non-composition, is quite continuous in more recent work that I'm quite so directly connected to photography. Now, what I'm going to we're going to see two films, scale insisted that I show films. Uh, one's from 1970, the other's from 1973. And um, then we're going to just look at a bunch of, it's mostly paintings. Uh, so, yeah, mostly yeah, paintings. But um, Steele said that my films were edited, and if I'm allowed to correct you, I would say that my films are constructed as opposed to edited. And what I think is at stake in this distinction is the difference between uh, composition, which is an attribute of which editing is um, a, uh, a means, and um, construction. So composition, construction. Uh, composition is personal, expressive, subjective. Construction is impersonal, mechanical, um, anti-subjective. And uh, these two, uh, this, this binary relationship, this binary pair is a way of understanding a certain history within modern uh, Jack's head. Well, I mean, you can choose your own examples, but um, I'll mention the songs that go along. Uh, I come down on the side of the of construction, which is to say, um, the impersonal, which is to say that my ambition is to make or <coughs> having as little to do with it as possible, given that, in fact, the work won't be there without me, but I'm to keep myself out of it to the greatest possible extent. Um, fine art at Harvard is really fine art, and it means art history. It doesn't mean studio art. My education as an artist consists of uh, I took life drawing in summer school at the Art Institute in Chicago, and then art methods and materials, and then that was the extent of my art school education, and then I went to film school for a year and a half, and I left before getting a degree. And um, I'll just say a couple of words now about my introduction, my, 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 my beginning in photography. My father was a skilled amateur photographer, but he had conventional ideas about photography. He believed in composition, you know, balanced masses, dominant forms, subordinate forms, um, um, that kind of thing. And when I took my first roll of photographs with my uh, brownie camera with 127 film, he critiqued my photographs and said that this was a good photograph that was of our Conquer Spaniel because the Conquer Spaniel in the upper left hand corner was balanced by a mud puddle in the lower right hand corner. And he also told me that uh, a good black and white photograph had a complete grayscale. So these were, this was the kind of thing I was brought up with. And um, so I, he taught me photography when I, so when I was 12, I knew about hyperfocal distance and about, um, obviously, okay, hyperfocal distance and, um, yeah, I mean, that's, what else does one learn at the same time? Oh, yeah, sure, yeah, that stops all that. When I first started taking color photographs, I worked with Kodachrome. Kodachrome had an ASA of 10, and so Kodachrome under a brilliant blue sky was a 50th of 80. That was, that was 
and a fast film is Trimax is 200. And that was really fast. And people got all excited about, you know, big F stops, like 1.5. So that's how people thought about progress in the, te in the technical side of the talk. Um, well, fine. Oh, one last thing. My father was an architect, and uh, he taught me isometric drawing when I was relatively young. And if you don't know about it, I'll touch on this later on. But at the time, I also knew about perspective, and I thought that perspective was the more powerful technique because it was illusionistic. And little did I realize that in relation to the interest that I was ever developed, that perspective is nothing but a problem because you have to decide how to compose. Making a perspective drawing is the same as doing a photograph. You have to decide where to stand, the angle, the distance, and so forth. And with isometric uh, one's choices, in other words, there's nothing but choice in perspective, which is exactly what it turned out I don't want. And, uh, it turns out that isometric is, for my interest, a far more powerful thing because there are far fewer choices, maybe eight instead of an infinite number. And then even more powerful is, is um, orthographic. There's, there is no choice. Orthographic is only a matter of to, it's just choosing the object and then the drawing is in principle done. Not quite, but I simplify it, but not. And I learned about these things when I was a kid, but I didn't really understand how powerful they were at the time. So um, let's look. Oh, one more thing. Did I mention copy photography? What I, when I was trying to understand how I got into painting, I looked back at my films and I realized that what occurs in my films over and over again is the model of copy photography. And as you all instantly understand, a copy, copy photography is a case of there being no, no choice on the part of the operator. The only choice is the subject. But then given the subject, how you shoot it is entirely prescribed. And it's an impersonal view. In principle, I mean, because a photograph, in fact, it is a perspective view, but it's a perspective view of a flat surface with a, that's parallel to the picture, point to the film plane. So in principle, it's also an orthographic view. And when I discovered this, I was extremely happy. So a copy, a copy photograph, the model of the copy photograph, the paradigm is anti-expressive, anti-compositional. You don't compose a copy photograph. It, it, it arranges itself with the axis of the lens pointing directly at the center of the subject. And um, so it's impersonal. It's, you know, it's not subjective. There's no, no place for composition, creativity, expressiveness, none of those things. But, you know, that's my idea of a very powerful model. And um, also, I think you and understand that uh, a copy photograph is, in principle, also an orthographic view. If you, uh, where you look perpendicularly at a subject and there is no depth. But I wanted to mention all these things now because they'll come up later. But this is just to offer a kind of framework within which the work pretty much all of it can be seen. So let's look at the film. Um, <coughs> from 1970, that's called um, Production Skills. And let's see if I can actually get the disc to finish off. I did test this. Okay. And it's 11 minutes long. Um, one of the ways that to be not expressive in film is to work with standard units, like industrial units that film itself, I mean, as film gives them to you. And film loads are standard lengths, 100 feet to 400 feet. It used to be 1,200 feet, not anymore, I believe. And 11, so this film is 400 feet long. And that's 11 minutes and <coughs> six seconds. So that's why it's the length that it is. Put on the
Oh, perfect. Is that all right? Yeah, fine. Yeah, it's a very good balance. Are you advising on a 
I just want to look at this picture. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, it does a little. I can't really tell. Well, your best, you know, whatever your your best. Uh, yeah. It's close. It's very close. Mm -hmm. The, uh, okay. Okay, chicken half time. Sneaked in upon you there. Look like you're eavesdropping. You shouldn't have been in the I think this is about to get 
go. Well, just very briefly. Um, well, fine. Uh, I'm the director of this film, but what did I do? I, I gave the camera to someone else. So that I gave up control over the specific images uh, that you see. What I did was to create a situation that we can call it a schematic. And um, someone else took the photographs. Of course, it was understood that he would not take photographs of his shoes, for example. That he would take production stills. And as you know, production stills are a standard um, convention for when you shoot a movie, there's someone with a still camera who shoots people in the act of making the movie. Usually not at the very moment, unless they have a blimped still camera, otherwise the noise of the camera will register on the soundtrack and will be a description of the actors. So I created the situation and then I delegated uh, the actual, uh, let's call it the, the, the yeah, what, what we would call the compositional decisions within a framework, which in fact is not compositional. And as you already understand, it's a case of the copy photograph. <clears throat> and I could also point out that, um, of course, you all know about Duchamp and ready-made, and he said that when you, so a pack of Polaroid, you know, it's in, in eight shots in a pack, that's a ready-made, and a roll of <coughs> film is a ready-made, and as Duchamp said, when you combine two ready-mades, you still have a ready-made. He was talking about painting. The tubes of paint are ready-made, so when you combine two of paint and making a painting, you're still making which is a pretty radical thought, but that's what he claims. Um, and I think you also recognize um, affinities with, um, well, there's, there's, there's two relations to uh, being personal or to um, an instructor. First is a copy photograph, second is one thing after another, namely the module. And uh, I came of age, so to speak, in the 60s, and um, in the beginning of the middle of the 60s came minimalism. And people like Carl Andre and uh, Dan Flavin and Don Judd and Robert Morris were hugely important for me. And um, one thing after another is one of the models in minimalism, um, as if I need to mention this to you. Um, Carl Andre equal units. Two of the tiles are all the same size and shape or just in a row. Uh, there's no sense of you know, climax or it's just one thing after another. And so here also is one thing after another. Um, and this film could not be made today, I don't think. Uh, it was shot with a Mitchell, and the Mitchell has two pins. It, it's, I think the, 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 the pull-down movement has two pins. Eastman no longer makes 60 millimeter film uh, with double purves. So either I'd have to find a Mitchell that had been modified to have only one pull down. And it would be very important to have it a Mitchell because I wanted this extreme contrast between a standard Hollywood production setup and then the actual scene, which is to say little photographs mounted on the wall. And as you probably know, Mitchell, the, the Mitchell was for years the standard studio camera in Hollywood. And they did make a 16 camera. And it's on a dolly, which is a standard thing in production with sound stage and so forth. So it mimics or it reproduces the form of Hollywood production, but brought to bear on the subject that we can call a not a Hollywood subject. But of course, that's on purpose. But, um, and also, I don't think you I mean I still have this is a Polaroid 107. I think I still have a pack in the freezer. But um, not that I want to remake the film, just because. I don't think you can even buy this anymore, can you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What happened? Oh. Yeah. Now we're going to look at um, <laughs> picture and sound brushes. 1973. Um, at the time I made this film, I didn't realize that it was fine. And for years I couldn't bear to look at it because I found it so embarrassing. But um, now it's okay. I can laugh at it. And 
<coughs> don't, if you think it's funny, laugh. My feelings won't be too terribly hurt. Now, <coughs> that production still is one shot. So there's no editing. Well, editing in a sense in that the success for the succession of Polaroids in effect become shots. So one way to look at it is it's a storyboard in the form of still photographs. Um, but that's a good way to avoid having to edit is to make a film that's only one shot long. A lot of my films are in fact one shot. And, um, and also the camera doesn't move. Uh, because if you move a camera you have to decide how to move it and I like there to be reasons for things and this other question as well, what's the reason to move? move the camera in a certain way. This question of there being reasons for things is another way of looking at the question of construction. Um, another way of looking at the distinction between construction and composition is the distinction between the, <coughs> the, I have to, I have to get this right, um, the motivated and the unmotivated. And what the motivated means in the way I'm using is that the person who does the work can point to reasons for things being the way they are that do not come from within him or herself. It's, you, you, you say it's this way because, and then you can cite a reason that lies beyond the purview of your own mystical, inner, creative, psychic landscape. And then, so this is not so, so construction is paired, it is, is an expression, so to speak of the motivated and composition of the unmotivated or the arbitrary. So what I what my general work in general is opposed to is the arbitrary, which is to say I'm just being creative me. I, I'm interested in a different model. So this is picture and sound rushes from 1973 and it's 11 minutes. And um, it uses industry terms. And rushes, I think some of you know, they're also called dailies when you're working on a production. Well, it doesn't have to be in Hollywood, just film, period. Rushes are what you shoot that day, or the day before. You take them to the lab, and the lab develops them overnight. You look at them the next day. And they're rushes because it's a rush order. So yeah, when you're shooting a feature, day after you shoot, you see what you shot the day before. So you're looking at the rushes. And it's the, it's the totality of what was shot. You see everything. Well, all of the takes that you decided to print. In 35, it's so expensive, you don't print everything. You, you decide what you're going to print and what you don't. So rushes is the total of what gets printed. Uh, it uses industry terms. Sync, MOS, which means uh, film shot without sound, <coughs> it's shot silent. And wild sound, which means sound recorded without picture. And then I had to invent a name for the, so it's picture, picture, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm performing the film for you. Picture and sound together are seen. Picture, picture only is MOS. Sound only is wild. And there needs to be a name for the case where there is neither sound nor image. And of course, commercial movies never do this, so there's no term for it in the industry. So I had to make one up, and my word for it is the null case. And this movie puts the null case on a par with all these other possible, or not very many, only three relations between um, image and sound. So picture and sound relations. Uh, in film, there are two basic components, picture and sound. Each of these components can be present or absent. In either form, present or absent, uh, both picture and sound can combine with either form of the other. So you can have...
four. There are four uh, combinations: sound picture sync, picture only MOS, sound only, which is wild, and neither, which is null. Now consider uh, this case. Imagine starting uh, a sequence with with uh, with any one of these four combinations. Let's take the case of sync. It starts a a pattern uh, or a series with sync, and then in sequence, you go to each of the other three combinations in turn, going back to the one you started with, in this case, sync, in between each of the other three. So, uh, for example, <coughs> you start with sync, uh, you then go to the next case, which is MOS, and then you go back to sync, uh, and then having touched base, so to speak, you then go on to the next case, which is wild sound, and uh, then you go back to sync, and then, uh, then you go on to the fourth uh, case, which is the which is null. Now, uh, imagine going through the same pattern. <coughs> Wild to sync occurs twice. 
and the change from wild to MOS occurs twice, but the change from wild sound to the null state occurs only once. The change from the null state to sync occurs only once. The change from the null state to uh, MOS occurs twice, and the change from null state to wild occurs twice. And there's a, uh, only once, only once does it happen that the same, uh, same state occurs twice in a row, and that is the null state. Uh, the, going from the end of the series that starts with, with This uh, irregularity in the, uh, in the in the frequency of the changes is just uh, it's just happenstance because.
No one left. It, that's all. Was anyone? I mean, I, yes, it's I'm pathetic, but that doesn't mean you can't laugh. But anyway, <laughs> very very quickly. Um, obviously, someone else I admired immensely was Saul Witt. I did a lot of work with um, combinations and permutations. And so this film was a very great deal to his way of looking at things, which I would point out is another way to be non-compositional. And as you could gather in what you did hear uh, of what I said, uh, it's entirely based on arithmetic. It just has to do with if these are the combinations, then there are so many combinations, and if you divide that by the running time of the film, that means that each one is, in fact, 27 and three quarters seconds long. And um, what might not be clear to you is that it's 11 minutes and six seconds in principle, but I only shot 200 feet because the camera was turned on and off, just as the sound recorder was turned on and off. And for half the time, the camera was off. And so half the of the film is an exposed image. It's 200 feet. The other half of the film is black mirror. And, to, and so there's 200 feet of film, 200 feet of black mirror intermixed, of course, and together that gives you a running time of 400 feet. Well, the middle 11 minutes. And I performed continuously, even though the film was not recorded continuously. There were moments when the camera and the recorder were on, only the camera was on, only the sound was on, and also, and that's one quarter for each of those, and then one quarter of the film, neither the camera nor the recorder was on, but I continued to perform continuously, as if in fact they were. And um, my performance is as pathetic as it is because I didn't want to write everything out. I was very self-conscious about writing at the time, and I didn't, it was very hard for me. It, it's hard, the writing is hard for me, and if I would have had to write it out and be happy with it and then memorize it, and it was more than I could do, so I prepared very rough notes, and I spoke from notes, and I finally, in, in later work, I finally was able to overcome my problems with writing. But um, I hadn't gotten around to solving it yet. Now, again, I think, well, just, I think you all know this anyway, but at the time I started making so-called experimental films, a term I don't like, but it's hard to get away from, what do you call it, independent film, avant-garde film? Um, it was, the model was that you made a silent film. And if, you, if there was sound, it was added afterwards, um, for example. Or else you began with, with sound, for example, it was kind of filming a movie. You began with three of the four movements of um, uh, The Pines of Rome, and then he cut the picture to it. It was like making a music video. That's a rather crude way to put it. But in fact, there were films that were made like that. Um, I think Kenneth Anger made films like that. Uh, Custom car commandos to follow that model. But what you didn't shoot was sync because sync was the means that the commercial motion picture industry relied on. So it was the it was the technique of that institution that avant-garde film saw itself in opposition to. But I never had any problem with sync. I don't think it's just because I went to at the time, there were very few film schools, and I went to the one that was probably the most conservative, where I went without saying that ultimately you were going into the industry and had to learn how to shoot sound. <coughs> Accept it as the foundational mode. I never, I never, I never had any problem with sync, and this film instantiates that. It begins with sync. I refer to sync as the fundamental case, but at the same time, it presents these other cases. <coughs> on a par. It may give first place, so to speak, to sync, and the last place to the null case, which occurs in no film ever, let alone an industry film. But nonetheless, they are all equally or present in equal quantities. Very important. I think, actually, a film made by one of the situationists might have a 
an instance of the null case, but it's kind of a fake. This guy just cut in a piece of black leader into a normal film. So it's the it's the withholding of sound and image rather than the performing of the withholding of sound and image. So it's a different thing. Well, we're running out. Of, how much? I mean, <laughs> I, I'm okay. Now we're going to now we're going to look at work that doesn't move. But um, we're going to skip around because we're running out of time, and I want to keep this close to the talk. And does anyone? Well, I'm trying to find my bearings here. Does anyone have any questions that I can sort of you know, deal with? I, I have a question about the last one. Yes. Um, how would you address out of city sound? Okay, fine. Um, I, okay, fine. I, thank you for reminding me of something I should have said. Obviously, what I'm dealing with is um, relations, the possible relations between picture and sound at, in the moment of production. Moment of production. When you get into the cutting room, all bets are off. You can do whatever you want. Um, you can replace, you, know, you can dub, um, you can add music, you can add sound effects, uh, you can add <coughs> or you can add interior monologue, all that. But so it, this has to do with what is possible in the original production when there's a camera and a sound recorder. Can I answer your question? Okay, fine. Um, I have a question, Morgan. It's nice to see you. Um, these films are 40 years old, and usually we, we like in this department to think about how work um, relates to the social world that it's in. And I'm interested, I mean, as you know, I come from the same period. I'm, I'm interested in the fact that you're presenting them as if you made them last week. I don't know if you can. Yeah, as if I made them last week, or yesterday, or two years ago. I am? I think so. You're, you're, you're presenting them, them as if the issues are as relevant now. Not that I'm denying it, but I just wonder if you could address the relationship between your work and the social Can I interrupt for just a second, Graham, only to say that I, I'm responsible largely for the selection of what's being shown. Um, oh, I, I, just, I, just FYI. I love these films, and I saw them at the, at, when they were first of course. screen. But, but I, I just, no, it wasn't in any way we supposed to be made. sort of a historical anchor for them and all that more. Yeah. I think there are two questions. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for causing problems, Graham. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I got introduced, this is Graham Weinbrand, colleague, colleague and um, fellow soldier in the Army of avant-garde independent experimental filmmakers. And I knew, I met Graham uh, many decades ago, and, the 70s in Los Angeles, and, um, and here you are. Um, okay, so there are, okay, there are, there are, there are, you probably don't know that I teach in this department. No. Anyway, now I'm in trouble. Okay, I think there are two questions. One is why am I presenting these as if they're, as well, first of all, they're of the highest importance historically. No question. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, that with a face. I mean, I'm a modest guy. Well, actually, I'm not. I'm a megalomaniac. <laughs> but I pretend to be a modest guy. And I'm pretty good at it most of the time. But um, they certainly are a reflection of a lot of what was going on at the time that they were made. And I see. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, when we go see a Donald Judd show, we're not asking anyone to explain why on earth it's important to be reminded of Donald Judd's work. Or um, Carl Andre, to take perhaps a more problematic example. Uh, yeah, it's like, well, why do we need to look at Carl Andre's work? Because it's great work, and it's important work, and it perfectly encapsulates the very primitive. It's a, it, it exactly embodies something very, very important about the moment in which it was made. And um, what you see me saying to imply that it wasn't important work. In fact, I show it in this very room. Some of, some of these films. Um, and the other question. Okay. Well, have we addressed the one question then? So yeah, that's not a okay. So I thought the well, one question was why am I presenting these as if I made them last week? Yes. I don't think I am. 
I think I, I don't. I, if you think so, fine. Explain why. But be brief. If you. But I think. This, I think. I mean, trying to. That's why I keep talking about these other people that I felt I was working in relation to, and as I've also tried to not, you know, explain. There's this question about how. Before I actually started making films, there was this. There was this paradigm that you had to make, you couldn't work, you couldn't shoot in sync. That's absolutely out of the question. Although Brackage made at least one sync sound film, Blue Moses. But it just, it stands out for being so extraordinary. But then along came something called structural film, with which my work is sometimes grouped. And um, again, I think the rule, uh, more often than not, was silence. And when there was there or when there was sound, it wasn't sync, although in wavelength, um, there are the sync sound s s uh, sequences. Where does that go? And the second question is, I think what you're saying is why, why do they not pay attention to Let's say, let's just use the word politics. The politics. No, no, I, I, that what you were heading at? I mean, I mean, how do they reflect the social conditions of the time? Not why do they not? But because that's one of the things that we think about, I think, a lot when we look at politics. Well, how does, um, you know, how does wavelength ref reflect the social conditions of its time, you know, 1967? Well, I, I mean, if you could have to that question, if you were here. I'm sorry? I would ask Michael Snow that question if you were here. Well, it might be okay. Why don't you call him up? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Morgan. I, I honestly didn't mean to give you a hard time. I just wanted to open things up. It would far be for me to dig Graham out of a hole, but but let me um, <laughs> <laughs> let me try to ask the question I think he's trying to ask, but if not, it's a question that I, that I would like to ask. As students, should we be looking at this work in historical context, or is there a way for us to contextualize it in terms of what you think is going on in the sort of um, video art world today? Okay, fine. Uh, I would say that it's more. I'd say that it's more the latter, and, and I'd say that it's more the former than the latter. Far more the former than the latter. But what I would point out. Underneath it all, and the reason I began by talking about this model of construction on the one hand and composition on the other is I think it's an extremely important model that has relevance starting with the constructivists, for example, and it, 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 it kind of weaves in and out of uh, the history of modern and contemporary art, and I think it should continue. I think it's, it's an extremely valuable model, and for all of it seeming to be confining, I think on the contrary, it's liberating because it saves you from having to express yourself. So what could be more liberating than that? You're being saved from having to express yourself. I mean, obviously I'm being a little satirical in how I put it, but I think it's a very, very powerful model today. It's not, and um, I mean, one of my, to the extent that I even know about postmodernism, people talk about postmodernism as if it exists. I know people who are convinced it doesn't. People who are reputable art historians who say absolutely not, there is no such thing. But to the extent that something has taken hold that's given the name postmodernism, I would say that it relies on um, losing contact with this model that I think is of the highest importance, namely uh, construction or um, working with the uh, motivated as opposed to the arbitrary, which is the, 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 uh, the company or the other side of editing. One of the things are, are composition. The important thing about editing, to go back to that word, is that you, every, every cuss designed to do something. You as the maker, you as the editor, are trying to control how the audience feels with each cut. And this is a relation to editing. This is a relation to the arrangement, the organization of shots that I have no interest in. And those of you who saw my film, parentheses, understand that that film may look as if it's edited, but in fact it's not. It's like 370 odd shots, and they were each assigned, each was assigned its place within a kind of matrix by a rule. 
So I made one decision that put each shot in its place. Lots of cuts, but it's not editing, it's construction. And um, the cuts are not designed to achieve an effect. It's just designed, it's just the way to get from one shot to the, to the, to the next. They're, they're units. In that film, the shots are units, and as units, they are all absolutely equal, just the way the tiles in the Carl Andre, or the metal plates in the Carl Andre piece are all absolutely equal. In Andre's work, they look equal. And in parentheses, the shots are different subjects and they're different lengths. But in my conception of the film and in how I made the film, they are all units and they are all identical. So I think that it's important to keep this model. This model has a future. It's not, it, it wasn't over in the 60s. I hope. I'm doing my best in, in my other work. Now, another question is, I think, and I've touched on this, is um, how it is that uh, the technology gives us choices and then takes them away. And that's why I went out of my way to say that I don't think you could make, not that anyone would want to, but I couldn't make production stills today. I don't think it's technically possible. Um, I think texture and sound rushes is technically possible, but I'm not sure. I made a film in 1983 that is 1,200 feet long. It's a single take, and Eastman no longer makes film in 1,200 foot rolls. The longest is, I think, 800 feet. Graham, do you know for sure? Okay. And um, and this, I mean, at the time I made this work, I never foresaw this. I, I mean, I just. I mean, Video, what's that? It, um, it didn't exist. And um, it never occurred to me that, that what has come to pass would ever happen. And um, have I dealt with Yeah, I would actually encourage us to, to then hold questions for a okay. few minutes and just, you just let Morgan have a few minutes to. Okay, you know, ah, this is ah. be our, Okay, uh, just very, very briefly. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll. Uh, what are we going to do? Well, you could do whatever you want, Morgan, but I just think I'm it'd, gonna, be, it'd I, be interesting to show a little bit of the. Yes. Uh, okay. Oh, no, it's never mind about that. Although, this is fun. See, this is painting, fun, color, <laughs> impersonal. <laughs> One second. Um, it's around here somewhere. I wanted to begin with. Uh, I misplaced the disc that had all this stuff in order. It's just truly embarrassing. Um, I'm trying to <laughs> uh, Sorry. I just want to make this one thing over. Um, just click once. Huh? Okay, fine. Yes, I need all the help I can get. Um, no, no. Okay, back to steel images. <laughs> I just want to make this one thing come up like that. Okay? Yeah, fine. Now, um, I started, my, I started making films at the end of the 60s. And at the time, I also made uh, work that was not film. <coughs> and this is one of them. And it's, we can say that it's ridiculous and tri trivial, but I'll say a couple of things about it that will bear on what is to come and also relate to what I've been talking about. As you can see, it's a rubbing. And as you all know, being photography students, a rubbing is like can be thought of as a kind of contact print. So what this means is that the size is, so to speak, automatic. You do not make a decision about the size. When you make a contact print, the size of the image is the size of the negative or the size of the chrome area you're working with. Um, and this is something that became very important for me later on in painting, because the size and shape of paintings, in my experience, tends to Pass without notes. Of course, I'm generalizing, but we're in a hurry. I mean, Frank Stahl's work, the early work, was very much about calling, you know, making us aware of the size and shape of paintings. But very often, a painting is a rectangle, more often than not. And as such, we don't even notice it. So that the rectangle becomes a kind of container. My interest in painting is uh, making absolutely everything about a painting a part of what you consider when you look at it. So it's not just 
what's happening within this shape, which is usually a rectangle. Um, but the shape of the, rec the, the the shape of the painting and also the size. And I want all of those things to be cases of construction, or to use that word again, motivated, that they all come from somewhere. And not just because you go to Central Art Supply and there's a canvas that looks like about the right size, and you buy that canvas and then you fill in the paint. That's the model that I'm against. Um, so, I'm going to, can I go to more recent work that's actually related to photography? Please. Yeah. So just do anything. anything. <laughs> that's okay, fine. Um, a cup, I, I started showing at Bordelami a couple of years ago, and I, my first show was, in fact, um, connected to photography. And there were two, there were two bodies of work. Um, These are boxes of film, all from the 50s. And you already know why they're from the 50s. It's because that's the decade when I came to some sort of understanding that there was this thing called photography and it had a history. I should mention that um, my father, because he, was, he practiced photography, also had a lot of books in photography, not technical books, but but, um, but annuals, like U.S. Camera Annual. And that was, those were my education. I spent hours and hours and hours looking at U.S. Camera Annual from the, the, the 40s, some from the late 30s, and then up into, up into the early 50s. And I did not take these pictures. I don't mind admitting it. Um, and these are all unused. So these are, yeah, these are, these are sealed. And I think there's a total of 10, you know. And here they are. And my, so, but just, just a, little bit, a little bit more about the annuals. Um, I think you all know what the salon tradition is in painting. And the salon tradition persisted in photography, I think later than it did in painting. And in fact, photography annuals are, are follow the model of the salon in that there's one example. For any photographer, there's one example in the book. Although in some cases, there might be a couple. It would be like a portfolio of Ansel Adams, for example, or maybe West. But you look through these, and once in a while, you would find an amazing photograph of Paul Strand, for example, uh, or Paul Outerbridge. Um, and then there are all these other, I think that was like Horst, for example, I mean, people who, um, and then there are all these other people whose names are now lost to us. Oh, um, Bernice Abbott. Um, oh, heck, who's the woman who, Ruth, she lived and worked in San Francisco, and she photographed female nudes. Ruth Bernhardt. Yeah, I mean, I was looking at Ruth Bernhardt when I was, you know, 10 years old. I thought, oh, gosh, that's, that's nice. And I knew, I, I mean, she's good. She's good. And um, my, I knew who David Octavius Hill was when I was a kid. My father got a book on David Octavius Hill. Just, just one of those things. Not, not that I knew how to think about it about all of this. I just had exposure to it. But photography hadn't become aware of itself and aware of its own history and aware of the value of its history, not just its value theoretically, but uh, the market value, <coughs> for example, on um, daguerreotype plates. No one was even thinking about things like that. So this work is indirectly, I would say, about that moment. And of course, there's a certain pathos in all this. Um, these, these objects did not uh, live out the destiny that the manufacturer intended for them, because they survived to this day unused. And um, I'd like to do a parallel series with uh, European makers. Um, you know, their names go very, uh, Perutz, um, Lumiere, um, Orvo, Agfa, and um, what's the other? Um, Adox in Ferrania. I 
I'm still looking for a frame. You know, actually, I have a frame. Anyway, what, what did I forget for, for your European manufacturers? Oh, Ilfer. I'm still looking for Ilfa color and the Ilfa chrome. I have some Ilfa black and white. Yeah, it's all eBay. It's all eBay. <laughs> friend. Um, and then I did, that was one body of work, and here's the other. And they were presented in the Robbins, what do you know? Now you know why I want to begin with that. Uh, from 1968, more or less. Oh, and the, the medium, or the, the medium for that, the, for the for the rubbing I show you, is a blueprint, which is now an obsolete technology. In Los Angeles, no one will make a blueprint. There's one place that will make what it calls a blueprint, but it's not. It's a blue line where what is opaque in the original is a blue line instead of a white line It's in a blueprint. But then pretty soon they're going to stop making blueprints, and then blueprints will be a thing of the past unless you do it yourself, which you can. But it used to be you could take a drawing to in the late 60s when I started, you could, you know, if you were in architecture school, if you were the GSD, you just took your drawings over to, over to um, Fred Stone or Charette, and then they made a blueprint. Well, you can't get that done anymore. So these are rubbings of the covers of a British annual, a British photo annual called, it has a wonderful title, Photograms of the Year. So in that a photograph is photograph, which is, that's what they that's what they call photograph. And these are rubbings. And of course, I had to buy all these books. And it's this wonderful excuse to buy books. So it's the cover. It's 1950, 51, 52, a little crooked, 52, 53, 54. So we already see how how the passing of time and the change in conventions and design is manifesting itself. 55, 6, 7, 8, no, that's 9, sorry. The year I graduated from high school. Uh, 1960, I couldn't, so it's actually 11. Now, um, of course, the thing about rubbings, as you already know, is that um, the, the size is already determined. You make no choice. You choose the object, and there is no, that's the only choice is the object. And it has a relation to the copy photograph, except in a copy photograph, you have, you have control over the size. Although people usually like to know what the scale is. In some cases, it's important, like for archaeological work, for example, we need to know what the scale is. And um, I would say that this is a pure case of non-composition. And yeah, so only a few years ago, there I was going back to photography, still. It's a very powerful model. Now, is there time to talk about something else, or do we? Well, honestly. It's going to get much more complicated. Yeah. Okay, well, is, there, is there one image of one of the architectural painting things that you could just throw up? Uh, which one? Which? I don't know. I mean, the Portuguese one is on a poster, but just, just, okay. just a quick explanation. Okay, fine. So can I just talk about it without looking for sure. me? Okay, fine. Um, one of the, so the question in painting is how big to make it? What size to, yeah, what size to make it? What, what, what shape to make it? Um, and one of the things I found out is that I could use architecture to make those decisions for me. Let me see if I can find a one here from, and, um, Okay, fine. Uh, wait a minute. You, uh, okay. Uh, hang on. Almost there. Fine. <clears throat> I did a group of paintings called the Italian paintings, which I'm not going to show you because it's too complicated. But this is, these are the door and window paintings. And you can see why they're called the door and window paintings. Um, there's another, this is half of them. There's a corresponding half. In the other direction. So uh, the paintings are the overall dimensions of the paintings, are the overall dimensions of the window, and then they are fitted to the door, the two doors and the four windows. And uh, so this. Do you decide the aspects? That's you've put your finger on a problem, and that is I. 
I, for the, there, I, the, the idea didn't solve all the questions because for the doors I had to decide which of the two corners for the window, which of the four corners. And then I had to decide <coughs> by what extent to offset them you know, horizontally and vertically. And um, I found this extremely distressing that I had to make these decisions. But in the end, um, I think that the horizontal ones for the windows are all a little different because the windows weren't spaced evenly, so there was more wall between some of them than others, and there was a question of maybe filling up that wall a little bit. Um, yeah, this is just too embarrassing to have to admit that I actually made the decision like that. But, um, I owe you some candor about this. And let me just show you, so that's the other direction. Now I'll point this out. As you can see, there's very little room between this window and the end of the wall. So you have this absolutely preposterous pan handle that is 10, and, and so the increments were all, they were all in multiples of 10 centimeters. And so that is 10 centimeters wide, and it looks ridiculous, but that's what the idea required that I do. And um, the arrangement is in fact symmetrical. Uh, it's to the left of the door on this side, to the right of the door on that side, and then, you know, we're the same. It's like this for the windows, and then this for the window. And um, as you can also see, uh, the idea also determined the hanging. And uh, one of the ways you think about a painting on a conventional easel painting is you can put it anywhere. Well, not these. So, they can be shown elsewhere, but uh, I want them shown as a group, and they have to have the same relation to each other in the new hanging that they did here. So it's a matter of <coughs> measuring. So that <coughs> when they are shown elsewhere, they've been shown elsewhere twice. They look strange because it looks a little off balance, or it doesn't fill the wall in this pleasant, satisfying way that we think a hanging should. Well, that's because the idea requires that they carry into the future the same relation that they have here, even if it requires some fairly fancy manipulation to get them to do this. And <clears throat> obviously what you notice is that they're gray, so this throws emphasis on the size and shape, and it's, a, it, it's, it's supposed to be an 18% gray. That's what the, the sample was, so it's a photo gray. And, um, gray for me is a kind of default. It's a way for there to be something. Well, I, I can point to the source. Hey, it's 18% gray. It's, it's, it's the tonality that represents all possible tonality. So it's like a composite. I, am I correct? I mean, that's how I understand an 18% gray card. And um, this shape, which is usually the rectangle, um, but the shape, of the, rec the, the, the shape of the painting and also the size. And I want all of those things to be cases of construction, or to use that word again, motivated, that they all come from somewhere, and not just because you go to Central Art Supply and there's a canvas that looks like about the right size, and you buy that canvas, and then you fill in the paint. That's the model that I'm against. Um, so, I'm gonna, can I go to more recent work that's actually related to photography? Anything. Okay, fine. Um, a I, I started showing at Bordelami a couple of years ago, and I, my first show was, in fact, um, connected to photography. And there were two, there were two bodies of work. Um, these are boxes of film, all from the 50s. And you already know why they're from the 50s. It's because that's the decade when I came to some sort of understanding that there was this thing called photography and it had a history. I should mention that um, my father, because he, was, he practiced photography, also had 
a lot of books in photography, not technical books, but, but, um, but annuals, like U.S. Camera Annual. And that, those were my education. I spent hours and hours and hours looking at U.S. Camera Annual from the, the, the 40s, some from the late 30s, and then up into, up into the early 50s. And I did not take these pictures. I don't mind admitting it. Um, and these are all unused. So these are, yeah, these are these are sealed. And I think there's a total of ten. You know, and here they are. And my so, but just just a little bit a little bit more about the annuals. Um, I think you all know what the salon tradition is in painting, and the salon tradition persisted in photography, I think, later than it did in painting. And in fact, photography annuals are, are follow the model of the salon in that there's one example for any photographer, there's one example in the book. Although in some cases there might be a couple. It would be like a portfolio of Ansel Adams, for example, or maybe West. But you look through these, and once in a while, you would find an amazing photograph of Paul Strand, for example, uh, or Paul Outerbridge. Um, and then there are all these other, I think that was like Horst, for example, I mean, people who, um, and then there are all these other people whose names are now lost to us. Oh, um, Bernice Abbott. Um, oh, heck, who's the woman who, Ruth, she lived and worked in San Francisco, and she, Photographed female nudes. Ruth Bernhardt. Yeah, I mean, I was looking at Ruth Bernhardt when I was, you know, ten years old. I thought, oh, gosh, that's that's nice. And I knew, I, I mean, she's good. She's good. And um, my, I knew who David Octavius Hill was when I was a kid. My father got a book on David Octavius Hill. Just, just one of those things. Not, not that I knew how to think about it about all of this. I just had exposure to it. But photography hadn't become aware of itself and aware of its own history and aware of the value of its history, not just its value theoretically, but uh, the market value, <coughs> for example, on um, daguerreotype plates. No one was even thinking about things like that. So this work is indirectly, I would say, about that moment. And of course, there's a certain pathos in all um, these these objects did not uh, live out the destiny that the manufacturer intended for them because they survived to this day unused. And um, I'd like to do a parallel series with uh, European makers. I mean, you know, their names: Gouvert, uh, Perutz, um, Lumiere, um, Orvo, Agfa, and um, what's the other? Adox in Ferenia. I'm still looking for Ferenia. I actually I have a Ferenia. Anyway, what, what did I forget for, for your European manufacturers? Oh, Ilford. Ilford. Yeah. I'm still looking for Ilfa color and the Ilfa chrome. I have some Ilford black and white. Yeah, it's all eBay. It's all eBay. It's <laughs> <laughs> our friend. Um, and then I did, that was one body of work, and here's the other. And they were presented in. Robbins, what do you know? Now you know why I want to begin with that. Uh, from 1968, more or less. Oh, and the, the medium, or the, the medium for that, the, for the for the rubbing I show you, is a blueprint, which is now an obsolete technology. In Los Angeles, no one will make a blueprint. There's one place that will make what it calls a blueprint, but it's not. It's a blue line where what is opaque in the original is a blue line instead of a white line, it's in a blueprint. But then pretty soon they're gonna stop making blueprints and then blueprints will be a thing of the past unless you do it yourself, which you can. But it used to be you could take a drawing to you know, the late 60s when I started, you, could, you know, if you were in architecture school, if you were the GSD, you just took your drawings over to, over to Fred Stone or Charette, and then they made a blueprint. Well, you can't get that done anymore. So these are rubbings of the covers of a British 
annual, a British photo annual called, it has a wonderful title, Photograms of the Year. So in, instead of photographs, it's photograms, which is, that's, what they're, that's what they call photograph. And these are Robins. And I had to buy all these books. And it's this wonderful excuse to buy books. So it's the cover, it's 1950, 51, 52, a little crooked, 52, 53, 54. So we already see how, how the passing of time and the change in conventions and design is manifesting itself. 55, 6, 7, 8. No, that's nine, sorry. The year I graduated from high school. Uh, 1960, I couldn't, so it's actually 11. Now, um, of course, the thing about Robbins, as you already know, is that um, the, the size is already determined. You make no choice. You choose the object, and there is no, that's the only choice is the object. And it has a relation to the copy photograph, except in a copy photograph, you have, you have control over the size. Although people usually like to know what the scale is, in some cases it's important, like for archaeological work, for example, we need to know what the scale is. And um, I would say that this is a pure case of non-composition. And yeah, so only a few years ago there I was going back to photography, still. It's a very powerful model. Now is there time to talk about something else or do we? Well, honestly. It's going to get much more complicated. Yeah. Okay, well, is, there, is there one image of one of the architectural painting things that you could just throw up? Uh, which one? Which? I don't know. I mean, the, the Portuguese one is on a poster, but just, just, okay. just a quick explanation. Okay, fine. So can I just talk about it without looking for sure. you? Okay, fine. Sure. Um, one of the, so the question in painting is how big to make it? What size to yeah? What size to make it? What what, what shape to make it? Um, and one of the things I found out is that I could use architecture to make those decisions for me. Let me see if I can find a one here from. And um, okay, fine. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, okay. Uh, hang on. Almost there. Fine. <clears throat> I did a group of paintings called the Italian paintings, which I'm not going to show you because it's too complicated, but this is, these are the door and window paintings. And you can see why they're called the door and window paintings. Um, there's another, this is half of them, there's a corresponding half in the other direction. So uh, the paintings are the overall dimensions of the paintings, are the overall dimensions of the window, and then they are fitted to the or the two doors and the four windows. And uh, so this tells you decide the aspects. That's you've put your finger on a problem, and that is I I for the there I, the, the idea didn't solve all the questions because for the doors I had to decide which of the two corners for the window, which of the four corners. And then I had to decide <coughs> by what extent to offset them you know, horizontally and vertically. And um, I found it was extremely distressing that I had to make these decisions. But in the end, um, I think that the horizontal ones for the windows are all a little different because the windows weren't spaced evenly, so there was more wall between some of them than others, and there was a question of maybe filling up that wall a little bit. Um, yeah, this is just too embarrassing to have to admit that I actually made the decisions like that. But um, yep. I owe you some candor about this. And let me just show you, so that's the other direction. Now I'll point this out. As you can see, there's very little room between this window and the end of the wall. So you have this absolutely preposterous pan handle that is 10, and, and so the increments were all, they were all in multiples of 10 centimeters. And so that is 10 centimeters wide, and it looks ridiculous, but that's what the idea required that I do. And um, the arrangement is, in fact, symmetrical. Uh, it's to the left of the door on this side, to the right of the door on that side, and then you know, the same. It's like 
this for the windows and then this for the window. And um, as you can also see, uh, the idea also determined the hanging. And uh, one of the ways you think about a painting on a conventional easel painting is you can put it anywhere. Well, not these. So they can be shown elsewhere, but uh, I want them shown as a group, and they have to have the same relation to each other in the new hanging that they did here. So it's a matter of <coughs> measuring. So that <coughs> when they are shown elsewhere, they've been shown elsewhere twice. They look strange because it looks a little off balance or it doesn't fill the wall in this pleasant, satisfying way that we think a hanging should. Well, that's because the idea requires that they carry into the future the same relation that they have here, even if it requires some fairly fancy manipulation to get them to do this. And <clears throat> obviously what you notice is that they're gray, so this throws emphasis on the size and shape, and it's, a, it, it's, it's supposed to be an 18% gray. That's what the, the sample was. So it's a photo gray. And um, gray for me is a kind of default. It's a way for there to be something. Well, I, I can point to the source. Hey, it's 18% gray. It's, it's, it's the tonality that represents all possible tonality. So it's like a composite. I, am I correct? I mean, that's how I understand the 18% gray card. And um, so 18% gray, boy, that's. That's my friend. And um, <laughs> okay. I'm afraid they have another class to get to. Uh, okay, fine. I didn't make these. It was all done by, you know, I sent the dimensions and I sent the sample and the guy did it with spray paint and I saw the paintings to be to be before the show. It was beautiful. So the hanging took an hour, just a matter of putting in the nails. Instead of the agony of arranging, which is to say composing a show. So, question. I really hate. I'm sorry, sorry, guys. But I mean, obviously, we're all getting the sense of how you know, complicated and, and involving a different. Maybe not complicated, but how involved and how many bodies of work we're going to really only scratch the surface of in the time that we've got. I want to just point you to a couple of places where you can kind of begin to get a sense of the breadth. Um, he's represented both by the. Gallery Bartolome here in New York. You can go to their website. They've got some stuff on it. Also, B O R T O L A M I, um, and uh, Daniel Buchholz, B U C H O L Z, in. Um, what's that? Daniel Buchholz is in. I'm sorry. Where's Daniel Buchholz is in? Cologne. Cologne, of course. Also in the was it the April part of America? There was a. Uh, Morgan is actually a very good writer, and in, I think it was the April edition of Art in America, he wrote an article, um, just it's a page or two, about his notion of construction, and it relates very much to what was one of the core themes of this discussion today, and that's, a, that's something I think you can find online. If you can't, let me know. I can find it for you. Yeah, it's, it's in the, it's, there's a series called Muse, and it's, the title is Ar Architecture as Source. So it's about work that I've, that, as I would put it, architecture has made for me. I'm being a little, I exaggerate, but you get the idea. But it, conne it connects, yeah. And there's, a, and there's a book. Oh, and there's an amazing book. Yeah, do you want to describe the book? Just, just. Just that briefly. Um, I, had, I had two shows in Europe uh, in 2011, 2012, and from that came a catalog for these two shows, and then there's a companion volume of writings. Just they are phenomenal. These they are. Um, I'm not shilling. I'm not shilling the book. I'm just mentioning it. Just mentioning. Okay. <laughs> and, and thank, thank you all for staying so long. Um, uh, and, um, and if you guys have questions individually, you can certainly come up and ask Morgan. Uh, yeah, no problem. Hand. We do need to get clear the shares and stuff out of it because it's a class that we can